it's almost like what, is ha what happened in the 60s with efforts to legalize abortion. We're at that stage now with efforts to legalize assisted suicide. And I've asked a wonderful man who has a great deal of knowledge about this topic to come up and share with us. Um, Bill Saunders is from Americans United for Life. And he has dedicated himself to these issues and is very well informed. And I think you'll be very delighted with what he has to say, and it's very informative. So, Bill, will you please join us? Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, thank the Diocese of the Mid Atlantic and Anglicans for Life for inviting me to speak to you, <clears throat> and I thank each one of you for being here. Um, as a pro-life person and as a pro-life lawyer, um, I'm deeply grateful for each single person who uh, is willing to, to help the vulnerable and the, the weak, which uh, is what, among other things, ties the two issues of abortion and end of life uh, or assisted suicide together. Um, vulnerable people, vulnerable people will bear the brunt of this. Uh, we know, obviously, you know, Mother Teresa said the poorest of the, of the poor are the unborn. You know, because we talk about helping the poor, and of course we should help the poor. But to be poor is to be vulnerable in any society, you know. And the unborn, of course, are, in that sense, the poorest of all, but so are the people who are subject to some of the abuse that I'm going to discuss in some of these assisted suicide issues. They are, you know, the elderly, the extreme elderly, the chronically sick, uh, those who are disabled, um, those who are perhaps disabled either mentally or physically, um, and also, again, the, the poor, those who don't have jobs and who are at the margins of society. I want to show you um, a, uh, you may have seen this, it's a pretty kind of well-known magazine called The Economist, it's kind of like Time or Newsweek, you know, if it's, it's British, but Lots and lots of people read it. It's very influential. And it used to be known as kind of a conservative journal, but it, it really, it's great on res reporting on the news, but its editorial positions are not at all social conservative or Christian or whatever. Anyway, um, in June, at the end of June, they had this, this issue, and the cover of it is The Right to Die why assisted suicide should be legal. So, the first point I want to make to you is to some extent we're like the people who heard of, uh, knew that tidal wave, that tsunami was coming in Asia. And they knew about it before, long before it happened because it was, you know, it was coming a long way, but they knew it was going to be destructive and they had to try to take steps to minimize its destructiveness. So my first point is a tidal wave is coming and nobody in this room should, should do one less thing for the unborn, but no that we must do something about this assisted suicide movement. It is coming. It is just out of sight over the horizon. And you can, that's obvious when you look at the demographics of a society where we have aging people, we have breakdowns of families. I, and I don't mean breakdowns necessarily in, in morally culpable ways. I mean, you know, the children may live somewhere else and dad uh, maybe lives by himself because mom has died in another state. And, you know, that, so the isolation, and of course this is a very sensitive issue. You know, my own parents have both died and um, one of them spent two years in a, uh, in a uh, assisted, uh, uh, not assisted living, she was in, 
confined to her bed. So a nursing home. So I know that everybody in this room, either now or later, is going to go through this. And I, and I know how painful it can be. So believe me, um, I'm sensitive to that. But with this isolation of people, the growth of the elderly, rising health care costs, the effort to contain costs, to manage costs, it's coming. I mean, I am as certain of that as I am of anything. It's a tidal wave. What is, I mean, on a crude level, what is the solution to that? It's assisted suicide. You know, um, that, I mean, on the, you know, I mean, not everybody or maybe nobody thinks exactly in, on this particular way, but I mean, the costs, you know, it contains the costs. It ends suffering. It, uh, you know, responds to people's needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm telling you, in Britain, they've tried for many years to pass assisted suicide, and they have resisted it. And they last, last uh, year, they tried again, and they resisted it. But it's not going away. It's a and it's not going away here either. It's a challenge that we're going to have to meet. We as members of the church, but we as members of, of a democratic society, as citizens, you know, we're going to have to convince people who don't go to church, who don't like churches, you know, or whatever. We're going to have to, we're going to have to establish the common humanity here. Uh, and we do it as Christians. We understand Christ died for each person. Um, but for those that don't understand that, they, we can help them to grasp that this undermines the dignity of every human being. And in a way, my fundamental thesis is that if you undermine the dignity of any human being, you've opened the door to stripping it from everybody. All of these issues are about what powerful people do. Not necessarily people in bad faith or evil people, or I'm not saying that, but they're powerful people. They're powerful because they can make decisions, the consequences of which other people have to suffer. So let me, so my first point, the tidal wave is coming, and my second point is an echo of when I was, of my days in the church, there was a hymn, um, I'm still a Christian, but I, uh, um, it was rise up, O men of God, rise up, O men and women of God. Because I real, this is a tidal wave. And if we're not ready and equipped to get out in the public arena and to get into our day-to-day -day interactions with people, you know, whatever. Not everybody does public policy like I do. You know, and I'm a lawyer. But I, if we're not equipped to understand this and express it, we're gonna, it's going to be terrible because there's a real push for the reasons I identified. And, and some other bad reasons. I mean, there's some people, you know, that... They, you know, or really think assisted suicide is good for bad reasons, but I don't say that for most people. There's, a, there's social dynamics and things that are at work. Um, so anyway, I'm a human rights lawyer, and I, the, the, the next point I want to make is, and this is very important for those of you, I think, who are not lawyers, is there is no, no, no human right to assisted suicide. Don't let anybody get away with saying that. Often in the kind of uh, imprecise public conversation, people say, well, I have a human right to this or that. I, okay, just as a lawyer, me speaking as a lawyer, you don't have a right to anything that, as, that you can enforce in court unless it is in some kind of legal statute or something court decision that gives you that right. Of course, parentheses, we're not arguing that's ultimately the right thing and it's, or it's philosophically right. All I'm just saying is when people say, well, I have a human right to this or I have a right to this. No, they don't. No, no international uh, human rights documents give anybody a right to assisted suicide. And in fact, um, there have been lawsuits under the European Convention on Human Rights claiming a right to assisted suicide, and the court said, no, that's not here. And 
this is in the era where the courts are very likely to be very ex to an extreme liberal extent in interpreting documents, but even that court would not say there's a right to assisted suicide. So, no right to it. Now, uh, you might, I'm sure you know, of course, in the, there's some countries that provide it. So, first point is there's no universal right, there's no human right. But that doesn't mean, then that, so it's like here in the United States, there's no national right to abortion, I'm sorry, to, uh, to assisted suicide, but each state then can decide for themselves. Same thing internationally, even though there's no international right to assisted suicide, some states have legalized, some international states like the Netherlands have legalized euthanasia and assisted suicide. And, you know, it's a miracle. Uh, you heard from a lawyer before we prayed and I can tell you as a lawyer, it is a legal miracle that there's no right to assisted suicide so-called given us by the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, you can look at the Constitution and you know as well as I do that it doesn't say anything about assisted suicide, but we came pretty close in the late 1990s. There was two cases in front of the Supreme Court uh, and the Supreme Court, despite, you know, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which had said liberty is the right to define the meaning of the universe, blah, 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 which is what is used again in the Obergefell decision, basically that whole, despite that, in 1997, in the Glucksburg case, the Supreme Court said no right to assisted suicide, no national right under our Constitution. So it's up to each state. It's up to Virginia, it's up to Pennsylvania, it's up to North Carolina to decide, which is great because we're citizens in a democracy and we get to decide this issue. It's not imposed upon us. And I can also tell you there's been litigation in a lot of state courts to say if we look at the state constitution, say, of Florida, that it gives you a, it talks about dignity and it talks about um, um, privacy. And so it's been argued, well, you put those together, that's assisted suicide. And the courts have said, no, it isn't. So on this issue, unlike, unlike the abortion issue, the courts have pretty much stayed out of it and left it to the people to decide. And I, I think that's good news because it leaves it up to us, you know, to to persuade uh, our fellow citizens. And we have the best arguments because, well, as I'll, I'll explain, but as you already know, assisted suicide really denies the dignity of the person who is being killed. Uh, that's why laws have always, although some have changed, you know, but they always prohibited suicide. A person can be suffering at the end of their life, and I suppose we all will suffer at the end of our lives unless we die very, you know, quickly from a heart attack or something. And you might be in bad, some difficult condition. So you might even be in an undignified position, but you still have dignity. As a child of God, you have it. It's there. Your condition does not change that. What your condition does is call for a response from the rest of us to your uh, bad, your, your suffering. So, okay, why is there this push for assisted suicide? Um, and why is there this sympathy for it? You know, because there, there are a lot of people, you know, that seem to, have sympathy for. Well, there's some free, some arguments that are frequently made that I think if we examine them are very bad arguments, but they're superficially pretty persuasive or attractive arguments. And they're the kind of arguments you will hear. 
Uh, and I just mentioned that Georgette has an article that I did some years ago, and it, it goes through some of these in, in more detail. And if you want a copy of it, it's only about four pages, uh, it's, but I'm sure she could send it to you or whatever. But usually the argument for assisted suicide is based on kind of two, or it has two strands to it. One is autonomy and one is compassion. Um, sometimes uh, one branch there is emphasized more to the other. Sometimes one is argued to the exclusion of the other. But it's autonomy or compassion. You know, I ha that's the kind of I have a right to, so this is not on the legal level, but on some kind of philosophical level, I have a right to whatever I want. But the arguments for autonomy and compassion mischaracterize them and um, misunderstand what really autonomy and compassion really are. I think that we're going to have uh, four speakers, and your last speaker, I think, is going to look at some of these issues in the clinical context, uh, in the hospital or whatever. And, and so I'm, I'm not going to go into all these in, all the, in a great lot of detail, because I think some of what I'm going to say and what the next speakers will say, but I'm going to, I'm going to hit a few of these points to help you, I, I hope, to start thinking about this. Because you hear somebody say, okay, we should have assisted suicide, we should legalize assisted suicide if somebody is in, you know, unbearable suffering. And, and you know, you, you, on the, your first response to that is that is, you're sympathetic to it. I mean, you, you don't know, everybody is sympathetic to somebody who's in that situation. But putting it that the way that the advocate puts it is so misleading because what's the, pers you know, what, I'll just throw, go through a few things. What's the perspective there? I mean, who defines what's unbearable? Is it just the subject, so the person who says it's unbearable? And uh, let's, maybe you say yes. Okay, if that's true, what if the person says, I'm an unbearable suffering because uh, I had a divorce, or I'm an unbearable suffering because my parents died. And that's a famous case in England where that argument is made. Or I'm unbearable suffering because uh, I lost my job and I haven't been able to find one for a year. Um, so notice, those are not medical arguments. They're not saying the pain level due to some injury or something is so high I can't bear it. But what's, but why, but so what? If what we're trying to do is respond to unbearable suffering, why do we limit it to so-called physical suffering? And you know, one man's unbearable suffering is another man's bearable suffering. Um, so what if I'm a doctor and I face two, two, two patients, one of whom has, and neither of whom can speak, one of whom has uh, some kind of leprosy, let's say, which is eating away at the nerve endings, okay? And we know how painful leprosy is. Um, we want to end unbearable suffering. What if one of those patients is able to write a note that says, I wish to be killed, which would be euthanasia. Euthanasia is the doctor killing. Assisted suicide is the doctor assist, assisting the patient in killing themselves. That's the two terms are used that way. But the other one can't write a note. Is there any reason the doctor shouldn't kill both of them? I mean, we have, I, I, in other words, in other words, if the standard is stopping unbearable suffering, then we would stop all unbearable suffering, wouldn't we? And 
That would mean even those who said, even though it's unbearable, I choose to, well, I mean, it might, you know, I choose to, to uh, bear it for the sake of the church or to offer it up for the unborn or just because I don't want to die. Again, advocates will say we should legalize assisted suicide because we must stop unbearable suffering. But does that mean we are judging that lives like that are not worth living and we should take them all? You need, need you think that I make these, this kind of thing up, you're probably all aware of the Netherlands. Well, the Netherlands requires an explicit, an explicit request to be euthanized. Yet, confidential surveys conducted by the government of doctors showed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people killed who did not request it. Now, is that because those were kind of Nazi doctors in disguise? No. No, 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 no. Don't get that idea. It's not evil doctors. It's an evil idea which affects good doctors. It teaches people that lives are not worth living, that there's some reason at some point that that life should be ended. And just because the person didn't ask for it or couldn't ask for it, doesn't mean they shouldn't have it because it is compassionate to end their suffering. So you see, I hope, how autonomy and compassion are playing together in a way, though, that has consequences that are very dangerous for everybody else. I mean, there may be somebody who wants to die, and they're, they're, they ask to die. But there's a lot of people who can't ask to die and don't want to die, but are still going to suffer those consequences because we're teaching doctors, I believe we're teaching doctors, that some lives are not worth living. And doctor, that, I don't want any doc, that is the end of the medical profession. Doctors are to, you know, cure if possible, but to, you know, medicate and help not to end the lives of the, uh, the people that they're treating. So there's an inevitable, logical, and practical slippery slope. And don't be put off when somebody says, oh, you're just making a slippery slope argument. Well, so what if it's, if it's a good argument? And the facts, and you know, the facts from Netherlands back it up. They show it. This is what happens. People who don't request it are killed. And it's, we, we're, because we're convincing society and doctors that certain people shouldn't be around. You know, recently, unfortunately, California uh, legalized assisted suicide. And part of the reason, I mean, it, it, it's so sad because the, the governor, you know, Jerry Brown, you know, he's a, he's, you know, a liberal and all that stuff. But he was a seminary student, I believe in a Catholic seminary. He, he kind of takes, he intends to take spiritual things seriously. Um, I know somebody that he met with uh, before he, he signed this law, which was kind of pushed through the legislature in a probably illegal way, but still. Um, but when he did it, you know, um, he said, he, he, he thought about, from his perspective, you know, would he want to have this right to kill himself? And I understand that. But I su suggest it's exactly the wrong question. And I want to just quote to you this, this, uh, this was the Catholic Archbishop of Los Angeles who sent a letter to Governor Brown before he made this decision. And, and again, just listen, let's echo to what I said before. Already we know that poor families, African Americans, Latinos, and immigrants do not have access to quality health care, and they have limited treatment options when they face a serious 
or terminal illness. In a healthcare system that is cost conscious and profit driven, driven, do we really imagine that these vulnerable populations will have a choice um, to receive um, end of life care once we make lethal prescriptions an acceptable treatment option? And it's, I mean, it's sad for a million reasons, but it's sad that somebody like Jerry Brown, who would see himself as a great advocate for the poor and the, uh, the vulnerable and the marginalized, couldn't see that. Now, um, just to step back, uh, there's really three points I want to make, and I've made two of them, just to remind you what they are. One is there's no, there's no right to assisted suicide. There's no universal right or human right. And if it exists, it's a, question, it's a question of local law, local being even state level law. So, you know, don't be pushed around by people saying, well, I have a right. I mean, that's what we're deciding is whether or not you have a right to do this. And the arguments, second point, the arguments made for it are based on autonomy or compassion and, and both are just slippery and manipulable and unsatisfactory. I hope in ways that I've illustrated to you. I know we'll have questions later so we can talk more about it. But third of all, there's a sol there is, I believe, a solution to this. It's not a perfect solution. I haven't run into any perfect solutions in my life, but it's a, it's a solution. It's a multifaceted solution. Number one, we go back to that unendurable pain that's largely uh, that's uh, largely an untrue way of putting it. Palliative care can palliate physical pain, and I'm not a doctor, but you know the uh, a survey of the palliative care specialists in the United Kingdom in 2007, they agreed that palliative care could make could uh, could palliate the the pain and into so you would have a death with dignity. So we can handle physical pain. Nobody, and, it, and this is a scandal, we should make sure that palliative care is available to people who are in pain. So one of the solutions is to pass laws that require training in palliative care and provide resources to hospitals and medical schools for palliative care. Number two, another study by the Royal College of Physicians in 2007 showed that almost every single request for assisted suicide comes from a clinically depressed person. And most doctors can't diagnose depression. They're not trained in it. So there's the mental anguish, the spiritual anguish. The doctors aren't properly trained to either diagnosis or, you know, or refer to some, you know, so you don't treat it. So it's not compassionate to say to somebody in deep physical pain, here's your options. Lay there and suffer or I'll kill you. Or to say to somebody whose heart is ripped apart by suffering or they're so depressed they think their life is meaningless and say, okay, lie there and keep thinking about how worthless you are or you can kill yourself. The response is true compassion, right? Step in, very, you know, it's a great challenge. Step in to that person's pain and suffering and help them to suffer with them, ha help them to deal with it. And so we can do, we can increase the palliative care resources, we can increase the uh, training on depression and treatment of depression. I know that another speaker is going to talk about hospice care and there's some, unfortunately, some, some bad things going on in hospice care, but hospice as, a, as an institution is a place that's supposed to help people die with dignity. Um, uh, there are other 
things I could mention legally, I mean, the organization where I work, we have several model laws, and you, could, you can go to our website, which is aul.org, and you can look up end of life. And so we have some laws that can be passed, including laws prohibiting assisted suicide. But, but I'm a lawyer. I work for a public policy organization. The solution is not a law. The solution is not a law. Law can, is part of it. You know, Aristotle taught us the law is a teacher. It's very important. It can stop or, or retard some bad things. But if we don't win hearts, the laws will not matter. They'll get changed. So I think we demonstrate our love, which we do have, for these suffering people by the increasing treatment and options on palliative care, on dealing with depression, on appropriate uh, hospice care, and then also we tell our stories. And um, I'm going to stop there because I think the next video is going to tell the story of somebody who was in a situation si similar to Brittany Maynard, who you heard about, who was behind the assisted suicide, I'm sorry, whose story strongly motivated the passage of assisted suicide in uh, California. But just one last thing is I want to read you a paragraph from another woman who had exactly the same uh, condition that Brittany Maynard had and who wrote her a letter on Facebook whose name was Kara Tri Tippetts. And she said, uh, Dear uh, Brittany, we simply disagree. Suffering is not the absence of goodness. It is the absence of beauty. But perhaps it can be the place where, where true beauty can be known. In your choosing your own death, you are robbing those who love you of the opportunity of meeting you in your last moments and extending you love in your last breath. Thank you.